I want you to think about your Bible. However you have your Bible right now, whether it's on your phone or on your laptop or your tablet, I want you to think about your Bible, and I want you to think about this. If someone were to ask you to sum up your Bible in one word, what would you say? Maybe some of you would say, believe, or maybe do. Or maybe some of you would say it's, it's the word be, because it's about my identity. Or maybe you would say it's think, because it informs a, a different way that we think about our world. Or maybe you would say it's read. When I think about the Bible, the one word that comes to mind is, is read. Read it. Or maybe you'd say it's grow. The Bible should cause us as Christians to grow in our relationship with the Lord, in our relationship with Jesus. And all those things may be good in their own rights, but I, I think when I conceive of the scriptures, when I think about the Bible, I think the word that comes to mind for me is Jesus. It's Jesus. As we come to the Beatitudes, we come to a sermon that is a sermon preached by Jesus about Jesus. In fact, as we get into the sermon, the, the words of, of James Boyce, who's written a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, come to mind when he said this, the Sermon on the Mount was preached by the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, the Sermon on the Mount was preached by the one who perfectly fulfills and perfectly models everything that's commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, he's the only one that perfectly fulfills and perfectly models everything that's written and commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'd like to read through all of the Beatitudes together. This is going to be a, a 30,000-foot introductory message to the Beatitudes as a whole. We'll get into the first one, that blessed are the poor in spirit. We'll get into that next week. But there's some things that we need to cover and some groundwork that we need to lay before we get into that. Matthew chapter 5, let's pick up in verse 3, or actually we'll start in verse 1. It says, Jesus, seeing the crowds, went up on the mountain where he sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When I first thought about this series, this sermon series on the Beatitudes, I, I thought about approaching it from the angle of this is a, a sermon series about our happiness and our holiness and how those two things are related together. Because that word blessed in, in the Greek there is a word that means happy, fortunate. We'll get to that in a, a few minutes here. And so it's about how we can be happy and the way that we can be happy according to Jesus in the Beatitudes is through our pursuit of holiness. And so there's truth to that, but the problem that I encountered is if I preach this sermon series that way, what we're all going to walk away with at the end of each week are, are thoughts like this. I, I need to be more poor in spirit. I'm not poor enough. I need to mourn more than I do over this fallen world. I, I don't mourn enough. I need to be meeker than I am and less domineering. I, I'm not meek enough. I should be hungrier and thirstier for righteousness. I, I, don't, I don't desire righteousness enough. I should be more merciful and less demanding. I should be purer than I am, more pure. I should be bolder in my faith because I'm not being persecuted for righteousness sake. And so I'm not, I'm not doing enough. And see, the way that I wanted to preach this series was just that way, that it would have turned into essentially a, a set of moralistic sermons about how none of us are doing enough, myself included. And as I was preparing for this and as I was thinking about this, I thought about those sermons and I said, man, I can hit the target on those sermons every single time. It's not hard for us to hold up the Bible and see where we fall short. That's easy. And it may be true that all of us have room to improve. In fact, I know it's true that we have room to improve in every single one of these areas. I have plenty of room to improve in these areas. 
But the problem with preaching this as though it's a series of moralistic commands is twofold. Number one, it makes the sermon all about me and not about the one that it's ultimately about, which is Jesus. It takes the sermon and makes it man-centered rather than Christ-centered. It makes it about how I can be a better person, a better human, a better Christian, a better follower of Christ. And, and some of that is, is certainly important to us as believers, but none of that matters if we don't have the root in place, which is Christ. The second problem with that is Jesus' goal in preaching this sermon was not to show you that you need to do more, be more, grow more, strive more. Jesus' goal in preaching this sermon was actually to say, you can't, but I did. See, the goal of the Sermon on the Mount was not to leave us feeling like we need to do more, but to cause us to love more the one who's done it all. The Sermon on the Mount, as I talked about at the beginning when I said that the, the, the Bible is about Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount is about Jesus. And as we study the Beatitudes, it should cause us to think about Jesus and to love Jesus more and to pursue a relationship with Jesus more fervently than we are even right now. In Luke 24, verses 25 through 27, you have Jesus and these two disciples as they're walking on the road to Emmaus. And you remember the two disciples are astounded that, that Jesus doesn't know about the fact that Jesus died on the cross. You remember that? They, we thought this man was going to be the Savior. And Jesus says in verse 25, He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so this is a sermon from Jesus about the Bible being about Jesus. John 5.39. Jesus says in John 5.39 to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about who? He says, me. The scriptures bear witness about me. The Bible is about me. John 5, 45 through 46. Jesus said, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, and that's Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. There you have Jesus saying, Look, you, you hold the, the Torah in such high honor, in such high regard. But understand that Moses was writing about me, that even the Torah, these commandments that you have memorized were meant to point you to me. Paul in Galatians 3.24 says the law was a guardian until Christ appeared because the law was there to reveal our sin and our need for deliverance. Luke 16.29, you've got the, the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus. And you've got the scene where the rich man is in Hades and he's suffering under the torment of God's wrath against his sin. And he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham at the side of Abraham. And he calls out to Lazarus and says, dip your hand in a, a drop of cool water and let me have but a drop to relieve my pain. And of course he's told, no, that's not possible. And then the rich man re replies and says, well then send, he's talking to Abraham. He says, send Lazarus back to my family so that they don't meet the same fate that I'm currently experiencing. Get Lazarus to go back and tell them to repent and to believe is essentially what the rich man is saying here. And Abraham's response is, they have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, Moses' response in this story that, or Abraham's response, sorry, in the story that Jesus is telling them is that they have everything that they need in the prophets and in Moses to understand what they need to understand about Jesus. Why? Because it's about Jesus. Back in Luke 24, again, that scene with the two disciples, Luke 24, 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms must be fulfilled. The law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, essentially the entirety of the Old Testament, must be fulfilled. It's all about me. John 1, 45. Philip found Nathanael. And said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So I go through those verses and we cover that, that survey just to again drive the point home, even from the mouth of Jesus himself time and time again, that the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. This is something that struck me recently. 
And I've probably been guilty. In fact, I, I know I've been guilty with you all, and I need to ask for your forgiveness of, of preaching moralistic sermons to you. Be better, do more, be holier, be more godly. Stop this, stop that, stop this, stop that. And it, is that an overflow of the application of the word of God? Yes, it is. Should we be conformed and, and more holy as a result of our encounter of God's word? Absolutely, we should. But ultimately, it should be about a relationship that we have with Jesus that overflows into a transformed life. Not the transformed life that leads to the stronger relationship with Jesus. That's backwards. The root produces the fruit. The fruit does not produce the root. And so as we study the Sermon on the Mount, what I want us to, to see and what I want us to understand even as we approach this is that this is a sermon to cause our affections for Jesus to increase, to cause our love for Jesus to increase, to cause our relationship with Jesus to excel. And that makes us a little bit uncomfortable, and I understand that, because we are used to sound and strong precepts and doctrine and steps and checklists. That's what we thrive on in our culture, and those have their place, to be sure. But I think they've, at times, overshadowed this relational element that we need to have between us and our Savior, because that's ultimately what it's about. It's not about a checklist. It's about a relationship. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus there fast forwards to the end of time. This is the, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. We're about to start the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is, is there and he says to, you, to, to his listeners, he says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we proclaim the word of God, Jesus? Didn't we cast out demons, Jesus, and perform other signs, Jesus? Lord, we know you. Look at our track record. Look at how many checklists we kept. Look at all the precepts we kept. Look at, we taught sound doctrine, Jesus. But Jesus responds to this group in Matthew chapter 7 with a chilling statement. He says, depart from me, for I never knew you. See, you have your resume, and you have your track record, and you have all of these things that you want to boast in, but Jesus looks back at them and he says to them, but we had no relationship. Your faith was in your spiritual resume and not in me. You didn't have a relationship with me. You had a relationship with my church. Maybe you had a relationship with my people. You may have even had a relationship with my word, but you didn't have a relationship with me. And that's what I fear for us. So as we approach the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing that I want us to see is that this is primarily about Jesus. And is it going to transform our lives? Yes, it's going to transform our lives. Because as we read this, and as we see that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of these Beatitudes, it's going to cause us to love him more, and in our love for him, we're going to want to follow him, and that desire to follow him is going to cause us to be conformed to his image. But we have to get the horse before the cart and not the other way around. As we study this, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, as we look at the Beatitudes, the, the Sermon on the Mount as a whole is one of the most controversial texts in the Gospels because there are so many differing views on how we should interpret this book, this passage, this sermon, these three chapters. And though we're only going to be at the beginning, I want to address a few things of what the sermon is not from people. The first is this. Uh, there are those that want to say that the Sermon on the Mount, starting with the Beatitudes especially, is a, a, a roadmap for the social gospel. That this is Jesus' plan to make our society and our culture a better place. So if we will be poor in spirit, if we will be meek, if we will uh, be persecuted for righteousness' sake, if we will turn the other cheek, so to speak, that this is all about making the world a better place for us to live in. And I would say that that's not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Will it overflow into that? I guess, as a, as a side implication, as, a, as a, maybe a side application, it's going to make us better followers of Christ, which is in turn going to have a, a good impact on our world. But that's not why Jesus preached this sermon. The second thing that people will say that's also not necessarily entirely accurate, in fact, it's, it's not accurate, is that these are legalistic standards for righteous living. And in the early church, during the, the age of the church fathers, many of the church fathers looked at the Sermon on the Mount, and that's what they saw it as. They saw Jesus' statement in Matthew 5.20 that the righteousness 
of his listeners needed to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. They saw that as Jesus saying that this is how you should be uh, living your life, that this is a legalistic set of, of righteous standards that we need to abide by. And I would say that that's also an incorrect reading of the sermon. A third view that is, I would say, partially true, and that is a view championed by Luther when he said that the Sermon on the Mount is essentially, a, it's a set of impossible standards led meant to cause us to recognize that we're incapable of obeying these things. And I would say that's true in part, but that's not necessarily the entirety of the reason why Jesus preached this message. And then there's another view that says that this message was only given to Israelites and has no bearing on the church today. And that, again, I would say is a view that misses the fullness of what Jesus is after here. I think the key to understanding what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount is in the first beatitude. When he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. It's a unique phrase. It occurs 32 times in Matthew's gospel and nowhere else in the rest of the Bible. Kingdom of heaven. And Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of God six times, and he uses the phrase kingdom just by itself another 12 times. And so at least 50 times in Matthew's gospel, he's talking about this idea of the kingdom. It's a major emphasis in the book, and it's a major point that frames the Sermon on the Mount. It's the first statement that begins this sermon. It has to do with the kingdom of heaven. It's not a phrase that you and I think of a lot, and we have to try to push back from the table a little bit and understand what is the kingdom of heaven. And I think there's three ways to think of it that are pretty common in our uh, theological circles in our in the church today and the first one i would say is this that the kingdom of heaven is the kingdom come thy kingdom come it it's all yet future it hasn't yet been realized in any way shape or form so when jesus came on the scene in matthew chapter 4 after following actually john the baptist in matthew chapter 3 and both of them had the same message repent for what the kingdom of heaven is at hand when Matthew and, or sorry, when John and Jesus both came with that message and then the disciples also picked up that message, they were announcing the future messianic kingdom. And so that what they were doing is, some would even argue that they were literally and legitimately offering the kingdom to the Jews if that on the spot they had repented and believed Jesus was willing to set up the kingdom at that moment and inaugurate his reign on earth in that moment. But obviously they didn't, and so the kingdom was postponed. But here's the, what it boils down to. Those that would say, thy kingdom come, would say that the, the kingdom is entirely future. That we are not experiencing the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom at all in our current present state here in the church. So that's one view. The second view would say, thy kingdom came. So the first view, thy kingdom come. The second view is, thy kingdom came. And this is the amillennial view. This is the view that says the kingdom, the reign of Jesus, is ongoing right now. That it was inaugurated at his first coming. That when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was saying that it's imminent and it's going to be inaugurated through the cross and the resurrection. And from that time on, Jesus has been reigning spiritually in the lives of his followers, in the lives of the church. And so when we read in Revelation chapter 20 about the actual 1,000 year reign of Jesus, the amillennialists would say, no, that's that's a metaphorical reign. It's currently ongoing right now. Ah, no, millennial. Ah, millennial, right? No millennial kingdom. And so they would say, thy kingdom came. It's already here. It's already on earth. And so as we read the Beatitudes, this is a description for everyone and for the church right now about how to be a kingdom citizen in God's current kingdom on earth. This is, by the way, not an issue where we would say one is a believer and one is not a believer. In fact, let me drive that home because one of those that would say thy kingdom came, who's an amillennialist, would be Martin Lloyd-Jones. Lloyd-Jones wrote this, the kingdom of God is among you and within you. The kingdom of God is in every true Christian. He, God, reigns in the church when she acknowledges him truly. The kingdom has come. The kingdom is coming and the kingdom is yet to come. Whenever Christ is enthroned as king, the kingdom of God is come. So the language of the amillennialist would say that Christ is enthroned as king in our hearts, as king in our lives, right? And they would say that in that sense, the kingdom has come. 
There's a third view that would say, thy kingdom already but not yet. Thy kingdom already but not yet. And this is the camp that, that I would particularly fall in myself. And that is this, that the invisible kingdom of God, so to speak, has already been realized. And that is that, that Christ is reigning spiritually over the church currently. But the visible kingdom of God, the literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth, and then the new heavens and new earth to follow, that is still yet future, and that will literally be realized and fulfilled in the future millennial kingdom. So it's already but not yet. We're already experiencing elements of the kingdom, but not its fullness. Its fullness is yet to come in the future. Maybe another way to, to think about the kingdom in Scripture is this way. Number one, you have the kingdom in prophecy. The kingdom in prophecy. You think about Psalm 2 when God the Father says, I have installed my king where? On Zion. On my holy mountain. And it talks about he, how he will rule the, the nations with a rod of iron, that he will crush his oppressors and his enemies. Well, what is that talking about but the future millennial reign of Christ? Or you get into Daniel chapter 2, and you remember the vision of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he's walking through all these different layers of the statue, and then finally Daniel gets to the, the rock. You remember the rock that came that was cut from the mountain as without hands, and it destroyed the statue? And Daniel says that's a, a kingdom yet to come. That's, a, that's an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom without end. Well, that would be this future millennial kingdom that's going to inaugurate the, the end, right? And so the, the kingdom in prophecy. The, the second part is then the, the kingdom announced. And that is Jesus and John the Baptist on earth saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so what we think about there, what you can conceive of there is that Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross, that Jesus is getting ready to do one of the final things that's going to pave the way for his ultimate second coming as he finishes his first coming. And so he's announcing, even if, as you think of John saying, behold, it is the last hour, right? Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's coming. Be ready for it. And so it's the kingdom announced there at the second part. And then the third part is the kingdom in waiting. And that's where we find ourselves today. As we await the ultimate fulfillment of Christ's return and the, the establishment of the millennial kingdom, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus on earth, we wait here for that to be fulfilled. And then the fourth phase is the kingdom in fullness, the kingdom realized. And again, Revelation 20, I would encourage you, uh, maybe even in your small group time, to open up and read Revelation 21 through 6. And how the, the kingdom is described there. This millennial kingdom being a thousand year reign of Christ on earth with his saints. Does the kingdom extend beyond the millennial kingdom? Certainly it does. You've got Revelation chapter 21 where God says that he is the, or John records that it was the voice of one who was sitting on what? A throne, Right? Behold, I am making all things new. And John sees the vision of the new heavens and the new earth. So the kingdom of heaven extends into the, the, the new heavens and new earth, but it's inaugurated there at the millennial kingdom. Well, that's a lot of talk about the kingdom because it's important for our understanding of this passage. Here's what I don't want us to do. I don't want us to get caught up in where you fall on whether or not you're an amillennialist or a dispensationalist or that kingdom came or that kingdom come or that kingdom already but not yet. There, there's room for those conversations and I think those conversations are important but if we spend all of our time talking about that we'll miss the point that Jesus is driving at here because no matter where you fall on that spectrum here's what I think Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount I think Jesus is painting for us a picture of the character of the kingdom citizen and he's calling us to live as kingdom citizens ultimately by revealing that he is the, the king of that kingdom and we as the followers of the king want to be like the king. And so this isn't about the social gospel. This isn't an, an impossible set of standards. This isn't a legalistic checklist. And this isn't just for Israel. This is a roadmap to what it looks like to be a, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And it should cause all of us to say, I, I want to be like this because I want to be like my king. I want to be like Jesus. But why the Beatitudes for us this summer. I want to give you four reasons. Four reasons why we are going to study this passage this summer. And the first one is this. The Beatitudes drive us to the gospel. The Beatitudes drive us to the gospel. See, Luther was right partially. Luther was right in seeing that the Beatitudes present to us a set of impossibly high standards for us to keep. 
The Sermon on the Mount sets out things that are so impossibly difficult for us to nail perfectly 100% of the time. As men, you, we've all read and, and I'm sure cringed at the statement of Jesus when he says that you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And for the majority of us, I imagine we would check that box and say, okay, good, I'm, I'm set, Lord, I haven't committed adultery. But then Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, anyone who looks with lust at a woman has committed adultery with her in, our, in his, his heart. And so what Jesus is doing in the, the Sermon on the Mount is in keeping with Luther's position that this is the uber law, that this is the super law, because Jesus is taking the law and then ratcheting, ratcheting it up to a, a higher standard. And so in a sense, it, it is meant to show us that we can't do this. It is in keeping with what Paul writes in Galatians 3.24. So then the law was our guardian or our tutor until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Or what Paul wrote in, in Romans 3 when he said, for we know that no one is justified by works of the law. That the law is meant to be that mirror that we gaze into that shows us our sin, that causes us to be driven to Christ, be driven to the gospel, to express faith in Jesus. And in a, a large portion, yes, the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes are meant to, to cause us to read this and say, Yes, but Jesus, I can't do this perfectly. And if Jesus were here with us, he would say, exactly. He would say, I did do it perfectly. And I referenced this verse earlier, Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't think Jesus was saying that in order to set the new standard and the new target for his listeners and his, his followers there. Because we think of the Pharisees and the scribes and we hear echoing in the back of our minds anytime we hear Pharisee, the woes, don't we? Woe to you, whitewashed tombs. Woe to you. You clean the outside of the cup, but inside you're full of, of filth. You're a, a whitewashed tomb, right? We hear all of that. But when the disciples thought of the Pharisees and when Jesus' listeners thought of the Pharisees, they looked at the Pharisees as the, the ultimate example of righteousness. They looked at these guys who had set their entire lives and then in their entire careers to keeping the law, to memorizing the law. The Pharisees were the ones that as they walked through the temple courts, people got out of the way for them to go by because they were the, the teachers. They were the righteous ones. They were the holy ones. So Jesus gives this statement where he says, you know what, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, guess what? Your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And his listeners, their mouths would have dropped at that moment. But I think that was Jesus' goal. And we should hear that, and we should say with what his original audience would have said, that's not possible. These guys are the righteous of the righteous, Jesus. How can our righteousness exceed theirs? Well, if you have an alien righteousness. If you have a righteousness that's not yours, if you have a righteousness that belongs to the Son of God, then your righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And that's 2 Corinthians 5.21, is it not? For he became sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, the righteousness of God. And so Luther was right. The sermon is meant to drive us to the gospel. It's meant to cause us to go, I can't live this perfectly. Right, we can't. Jesus did. And that's why this is ultimately a sermon about Jesus. To cause us to go, I need Jesus. Jesus, I need your righteousness, not my own. Jesus, I confess and I repent of my self-righteousness because I need the one who lived this out in perfection. I need your righteousness. So it drives us to the gospel. The second thing the Sermon on the Mount does, though, is it reveals more of Jesus. And we've talked about that in, uh, a good amount already. That as we read the Sermon on the Mount, as we read the Beatitudes, we see more of Jesus. Again, James Boyce, the Sermon on the Mount was preached by the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus is the one who embodies and who lives out each and every one of these Beatitudes perfectly. And in our church and in our culture we know a lot of doctrine 
We know a lot of the teachings about Jesus. We know a lot of theology. We know a lot about the Bible. We know a lot of uh, systematic beliefs, which are all good, very good, and very important. But why I love the Beatitudes is, is what I think we see in the Beatitudes is I think we see the character of our Savior. We see who he was in a, 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 as a man. Not the doctrine surrounding him. We see him in the Beatitudes. And we get to know him in the Beatitudes. So the Beatitudes reveal more of our Savior. The root man has to produce the fruit. And so for us, in, in every regard of Christianity, and certainly as we approach this text, we need to make sure that the root of faith in Jesus Christ, that a, the root of a relationship with Jesus Christ is in place. Otherwise, the fruit means nothing. The fruit is, Isaiah described it, filthy rags at that point. The root of our relationship with Jesus has to be in place. We have to get that right before we get anything else right. And when I approached this text, what my plan was, is my plan was initially to preach the fruit assuming the root. Which would have been an injustice to you and an injustice to me because it would have been an injustice to the text. We have to have Jesus in place for any of the rest of it to make sense. Third, we're going to study the Beatitudes because the Beatitudes will bring blessings to your walk. The Beatitudes will bring blessings to your walk. As you read each of the eight Beatitudes, they all start with the same word. What is it? Blessed. That's a fuzzy word in our context, isn't it? Blessed. It's a word in the Greek, though, that, that meant happy, meant fortunate. It was a word when it first appeared on the scene. It was used in, in secular Greek to refer to uh, the realm of the gods, that it was a blessed life that the gods lived in contrast to the realm of humanity and finite living. It then became uh, embraced by the philosophical world to refer to a state of inner happiness, that you wanted to achieve that state of, of, of blessedness internally, that state of bliss internally. Finally, it came to be known as the statement that we refer to this portion of Scripture as, as a beatitude. The statements of blessing using this Greek word makarios came to be known as beatitudes, which were a statement wishing well on someone, praising somebody's good fortune. And so that's why we call this passage the beatitudes. But these beatitudes will bring blessings to, notice the way that point is phrased there, your walk, your relationship with Jesus. I didn't say your life. Because this is certainly not a health, wealth, and prosperity text if there ever was one that wasn't. Right? As we read the Beatitudes, this doesn't provide a roadmap to us to blessings from a world's point of view. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted, who are meek. You're not going to find that in any sort of health, wealth, and prosperity teaching. Right? Right? We want to live our best life now. We want to have everything. We want to name it and claim it. And so as we approach this, we need to understand the, the nature of the blessings that we're talking about. The blessings that we're talking about are blessings as it refers to our relationship with Christ. That this is a roadmap that Jesus is preaching to us that, that says, if you want to be happy in the Lord, if you want to be happy and fortunate and blessed in your relationship with the Father, with the relationship with God, this is the roadmap to that sort of a life is to living a life that aligns with these Beatitudes. And so we'll see that the Beatitudes will bring blessings to our relationship with Christ. Finally, the Beatitudes are going to provide a roadmap to a God-pleasing life. They'll provide a roadmap to a God-pleasing life. If we approach this text with Christ in the forefront, if we approach this text as a, as a sermon primarily about Jesus, it is going to overflow into our life and make us more godly men. So that initial desire that I had to preach this series about it being about your happiness and your holiness and how those two things are interrelated, that still rings true, but only as a product of it increasing your love for Christ. See, as we study the Beatitudes, it, it is going to 
show us and give us a roadmap or provide blueprints for us to how we should conduct ourselves in a way that pleases the Lord, that pleases God. He does want us to be poor in spirit, and so we need to approach this praying that through this series that God would increase that in our lives and make us more poor in spirit. He wants us to be meek, so we need to, to pray that God through the Holy Spirit would cause us to be men who are uh, more meek or meeker than we are currently. He wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so we must approach this praying that through this series that God would increase our desire for righteousness. He wants us to be merciful. So we should approach this text saying, God, make me more merciful. He wants us to be pure in heart. God, make me more pure. He wants us to be men of peace, to be peacemakers. And so we need to pray, God, make me a peacemaker. And he also wants us to, to be ready for persecution for righteousness sake. And so we need to pray, God, make me ready to endure for that. Not so that at the end that we can push back from the series and say, God, aren't you impressed with me now? Not so that we can somehow prove that God made a good investment in us when he saved us. That misses the point. We need to pray, God, make me more like the Beatitudes because our desire is, God, make me more like Jesus. That's what God's after in our lives, isn't it? Romans 8, 28 and 29. Paul says, For God causes all things to work together for what? Good to those who love him, to those who have been called according to his purpose. Our problem is we want to define what that purpose is. We want to say, well, that purpose is that you're working all things together for good. God, that purpose is that I would be wealthy, that I would be healthy, that I would have, that I would be able to do, that I would experience, that my kids would experience, that my wife would experience, that... We want to define what that purpose is, but God defines it for us in verse 29. Because Paul continues, and he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, or you could read purposed, to be conformed to the image of his Son. So we find there that all of the good that God is working in our lives through everything that happens to us, the good that he's working is that we would be more like Jesus. And so, yes, the Beatitudes provide this roadmap to a God-pleasing life, but not so that we can be self-righteous. Not because we need to somehow prove that God made a, a wise investment when he saved us. But because it shows us what it looks like to follow Jesus, and we love Jesus, and we want to follow Jesus. Again, I, I think in my life, I've, I've spent too much time with just the wrong focus. I've been spending too much time in my life focused on the, the fruit more than the root and not allowing the relationship with Jesus to overflow into the transformed life, but looking for the transformed life to feel better about my relationship with Jesus. And that's just backwards. It has to start with Jesus and lead to the transformed life. And when we read the Beatitudes, what we find is we find Jesus, who was the ultimate man poor in spirit. Jesus, who was the ultimate man who demonstrated a, a mourning and brokenness for the world. Jesus, who was the ultimate example of, of meekness in the face of opposition. Jesus, who provided the ultimate example of hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Jesus, who was the ultimate one who was merciful. Jesus, who was the one who was pure above all. Jesus, who is the ultimate peacemaker, making peace between us and God, breaking down the dividing wall of hostility that once existed between us. And Jesus is the ultimate example of the one who is persecuted for righteousness' sake. And so as we study this, what I want us to see is I want us to see that. I want us to focus there. I want us to land at, at Jesus and be spurred on in the process to say, I want to follow him more. I love Jesus more as a result of these Beatitudes. I want to be conformed more to the image of Jesus because he's my Savior. I think this is a, a timely study for us, though I had no idea of what was going to be happening in our world. There's a lot of disunity in the world in which we live in right now. And the most amazing thing that we have as the church is we have Christ, and we can unite together around Christ, and we can anchor ourselves to Christ. And like I prayed at the beginning, He's the hope for everything going on right now. He is the hope for everything going on right now. It's not a vaccine. It's not a, a new set of orders from Governor Newsom in two weeks from now. 
It's not these protests stopping and going away. It's not a new set of rules and regulations. The thing that we need, the thing that the world needs most right now is Christ. And as we study this series, we're going to see Jesus. And my prayer is that it's going to cause us to love him more and to desire to follow him more earnestly. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this passage, this text. We thank you for just the good news of John 1, 14, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We thank you that Jesus has shown us you, Father. Lord, I, I pray that in this text, we would see more of Jesus. And that as a result of that, you would increase our affections for Christ, our love for him. And that we would want, as a result, to live our lives more obediently to him. That we would want to look more like Jesus as a result. Father, we need you in that pursuit, in that endeavor. We can't work that up in our own will and of our own accord. We need your spirit within us to, to cause us to have that mindset. And so I pray that you would be gracious to us and allow us to, to think this way and to approach the text this way and to live in response, in obedience to the text. Again, Lord, not to prove ourselves to you or to say, look at us, God, aren't you impressed with us? But to say, Lord, we, we love Jesus and we want to be more like him. And it's in his name that we pray these things this morning. Amen.